So again, our goal was to provide a standard and efficient set of uh, uh, tools that the offices could be using for storm damage survey data collection. Um, the interface was designed to be very simple, intuitive to use. Um, there's very few buttons. We tried to strip out any unnecessary components, so it should be um, fairly straightforward and easy to use as far as uh, the learning curve goes. Uh, we wanted to standardize a set of attributes so that uh, every damage survey would collect the same type of information and there'd be a, a single database by which those uh, attributes could be collected within. We wanted the system to be flexible so that the users had a variety of choices by which uh, they could enter the data in the system. And, and you'll see that you've got a number of mobile platforms or even an, a, uh, an in-office option for entering these data into the system. Um, there's a central repository, as I mentioned, that uh, the data can be uh, uploaded into. And all around, the, the data or the system makes it possible and has been proven to make it possible to conduct a large survey and provide offices with a quick turnaround on the uh, amount of time that it takes to get a survey completed and uh, posted and uh, into a form that can be create, used to create a public product. So this, um, this system all centers around a centralized database that's actually hosted on the cloud now. Um, we just migrated to the cloud this week and, and so far everything seems to, go, uh, it seems to be going well. Um, but this centralized geospatial database sits out on the cloud and uh, has a front end wrapped around uh, it that allows you to uh, enter and, and edit data uh, and send data back and forth to this to the system. Um, the primary means by which folks have been collecting and using um, <clears throat> the methods to enter data into the, the cloud system are through mobile applications and, and uh, PC applications that have been uh, designed for mobile use. And uh, a quality control aspect is is allowed by means of a web editor. And so the idea is that offices will go out in the field with mobile clients, such as a, a PC, an Android smartphone, or an iPad, or an iPhone. They'll take points as they do their damage surveys. So they'll enter these points into their, their mobile applications, and they'll transmit the data back from the field into the centralized database. And uh, as that data is being transmitted back from this, uh, from this field location to the centralized database that sits on the cloud, it's possible for someone in the office to be watching the survey occur, and uh, they can perform a quality control function. They can tell the people in the field that are getting the points. They can say, hey, you missed something out in the southwest corner of the county. We think you should head out and, and check this area out. You know, we've taken a look at where you've been thus far, and we think you missed something. Or, um, they can review the, uh, the data points that have been transmitted thus far, and they can QC those for, uh, uh, for the field uh, crew that's been out there. And uh, once those, those data are QC'd, that they can be uh, immediately viewed by the public on, on the uh, web viewer. So that's the whole idea, is that we'll collect quality control and disseminate the data. And on the uh, dissemination end, we've given numerous options for creating public products We've got the ability to extract data um, that have been surveyed into a KML shape file or GIS service type format for those users that are uh, interested in actually getting their hands on the data. Or uh, for folks that just want to have a simple graphic uh, screen grab type thing, um, we've got uh, the ability to just create a simple graphic within the web viewer. So any one of the uh, web components that, uh, that has been built into this uh, system here can be used to create a wide variety of public products. So here are your options for entering the data uh, into the system. Um, you've got the laptop PC application, which has been designed to run on a Windows PC. You've got uh, iPhone, iPad, Blackberry, and I uh, also mentioned Android applications, but uh, you can install the, the Android on the government-owned device, obviously, since there are no government-owned Android devices at this point. Um, but if you had a, an iPhone or iPad that was government-owned, that's an option. Um, you also have the option of installing this on your own personal device. And I'll talk about some of the issues uh, associated with doing a, a personally-owned device installation. Um, you do have to sign a, a 
security waiver uh, that was issued by the Weather Service CIO's office, but uh, it is an option to install this software on your personal device. Um, within the office, there is another place or another means by which you can enter the data. If by chance you have a big event and you don't have you know, multiple iPads or multiple mobile devices or even laptops that you can take out to the field with you, or your office just chooses not to do uh, mobile collection with uh, any of the mobile clients, then you do have the option of um, either entering the data in your office through the PC application, which couldn't be installed on any one of your local Windows PCs, uh, it doesn't have to be a laptop. And you also have the option of entering the data via the web editor clients, which should run on any Windows uh, PC that's got a, a web browser enabled. So you have a wide variety of choices for entering the data. Um, one thing to note, the system now is secured uh, to a certain extent, so there is a password that is required to access that editor, and also a password that is required to transmit the data from the laptop app. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you that password now. I'm going to type it in the chat so you can see what that is. And then I'll speak it out, and you're going to actually see me type that into the laptop application later. So the password is uh, capital D, capital A, capital T, lowercase i, lowercase a, lowercase n, lowercase s. I'm sorry, that's the user ID. And the password is capital D, capital A, capital T, lowercase u, dollar sign, lowercase e, lowercase r, uh, dollar sign. And this is required only for the DAT editor, the web editor, and the laptop app. There is a password that is required to install the software on your mobile device. Parks is going to talk about this later. Um, the password is just your, your, your email authentication password. That, that whole system is used to authenticate users uh, and to, uh, to be kind of the front end security of the Android uh, iPhone, iPad type installation uh, system. So that is the only other password that is required. Now the laptop application consists of uh, primarily a PC application. And if you have the uh, desire to use a GPS with the application, it's not required, but uh, we highly recommend using the, the Garmin 18 version uh, GPS. This is what's been tested and proven to work uh, effectively with the lap at laptop application. Um, we know that other models of GPS will work, but uh, this seems to be a good fit for the laptop application. That's what we've recommended that offices are interested in, uh, in using the laptop application by. Um, the key features of this laptop application uh, are uh, one of the main features are that it, it comes with a very detailed base map. And this base map is cached on the laptop. It's, it's part of the system. And it does not require that you have a cell tower connection or a data connection in order to use it. So it's an on-device base map. Wherever you are, you always have access to this base map. Um, the GPS will put your point and your position in the center of that base map at all times. And uh, it'll serve as a, an excellent point of reference. So it'll operate uh, completely independent of, this, of the cell network when you're collecting the damaged data. Um, it's got a host of point and polygon tools on it that I'm going to demonstrate for you to, uh, to be used to record the damaged data. And uh, another unique feature is it provides you with access to the EF kit. So you get quick access to the EF kit via a button. Uh, that the users uh, press, and it will bring that EF kit right up for you in case you need it as a, as a reference tool while you're out there surveying. Um, some of the newer features on this version um, that was just updated within the past few weeks, uh, we've got a new updated base map. So those, those of you that have used this application previously will notice the differences in the base map. We've, we've made some changes with the screen real estate. 
Um, we've got security that's been introduced into this current version, so there's a password now that's required in order to transmit the data. Um, you now have the ability to enter in uh, damage data and associate that damage data with polygons now. You previously didn't have that available. And now there's uh, another feature to auto-detect the COM port of the, uh, the GPS that's hooked up to the system. To install the laptop software, I'll just give you a very brief primer on how to do that. You've got two main options here. Um, you can either install from a DVD, and this DVD was shipped out to all offices but Southern Region offices uh, last week, so you should have received that uh, uh, earlier this week or possibly today. Ours just showed up today. Um, so installing version 6 of the laptop application from your DVD is probably your easiest option. Um, the second option you have, you can download all the install software directly from the DAC Google site. Uh, you know, most offices know that bandwidth is, uh, is not easy to come by these days, and so that uh, almost two gigabyte file size might be problematic for downloading, but uh, it is out there uh, and available for you to download. And I might add, if you didn't want to download um, the whole thing, you could download everything but the base maps if you, if you needed to. Um, the individual applications are uh, available to be downloaded uh, <clears throat> separate from the base maps. Um, there's a good detailed step-by-step -step set of instructions that are provided on the DVD and also on the DAT site. So uh, there is a uh, pretty good uh, documentation that's available. So that is the quick primer on the install. Um, I'll talk briefly about how you might be able to take this out and use it in the field. Uh, we've got a picture here of the laptop application set up in a vehicle uh, in Omaha, and uh, we do not recommend that you take the, the laptop out of the vehicle and walk around a damaged site. I mean, it's just tough to do. They're big and bulky. Um, so this is an example of how a laptop was mounted within the vehicle uh, in Omaha. And you can see the, the GPS puck up there on the dashboard. Uh, and this is a pretty effective way uh, to use the laptop application um, safer this way and, and uh, less risk to, to breaking a laptop if you happen to drop it out in the field. Um, you've got um, two main mode of op modes of operation with the laptop application. You can, you can operate either with a GPS on or GPS off. Um, as I mentioned, you don't have to have a GPS attached. The big advantage to having the GPS attached is you've always got your position identified on the center of the map. That map is going to snap to the GPS continuously. And, um, and um, one other important thing to note is that anytime you do draw a point or polygon on that map, um, that that point or polygon is always going to be uh, collected, the, the latitude and longitude and the, the position recorded uh, by that damage point or damage polygon that you enter is always going to be the location where you draw it on the map. It's not going to be the GPS location. Um, so that does give you the advantage of being able to offset GPS from offset damage points and polygons from the location where you are uh, currently with your vehicle and the, where the location currently is with the GPS. So you can draw offset points. Um, if you wanted to record the position of the GPS point for some reason, you can do that. I'll show you an option for doing that within the application. Um, the second mode for running it is obviously with a GPS off. In order to do this, you just essentially have to estimate your own position based on landmarks on the map. So you're using the map to navigate, and uh, any points and polygons you, you enter are drawn directly onto the map as they would be with the GPS. You just don't have a GPS point of reference. So. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to the laptop application and give you a demonstration on how we enter data into the system. So I've got the laptop application called up here, and uh, I'll just point out some features of the interface here. Um, the main toolbar is right up here at the top. You've got a, a pan tool here, which is a little hand, allows you to navigate around the map. You've got zoom tools, so you can zoom in and zoom out by clicking these buttons. And I know we usually don't have a mouse with us when we're out in the field, so you have to do all this via trackpad or some other means. And uh, the most effective way to, to run these commands is there are shortcut keys available, and I'll share those with you. I just documented those in the PowerPoint, but I'll show you uh, the shortcut keys uh, after we do the demo here. So you can zoom in, zoom out, 
Um, the next set of tools here are the tools that you use to document the points in the polygon. So this first three set of tools here, the little push pin, that is the tool that you would use to add a point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in a little bit further. Whoops. Zoom it out. And as you can see, as I zoom far enough in, a very detailed street map is going to appear with all the streets labeled, which is very helpful. And I'm going to draw, click on that, uh, that push pin and click on the map. And that's going to drop a point on the map. And if I don't like where that point is, I can actually move it around a little bit so you can click on different places. It's not locked in until you hit save. Um, on the right-hand side, as soon as I put that point down, you can see a, a damage menu come up and this use the, uses the EF scale. And so what you do here on this side of the menu is you'll select your structure type and then your degree of damage. And it's going to auto-populate this EF scale menu with a, a suggested EF scale and a wind speed. You can modify this if you don't like it. These are connected. So you can make changes and kind of tune that in. If you want to add a damage direction, you can do this. Uh, you can set a damage direction with your uh, compass direction choices here. I'm going to leave that unknown for now. You can add injuries, deaths, or any comments. Once you're done, um, all you do is hit save, and that's going to add a green point. So in this interface here, we've stuck with green points and red arrows. Red arrows indicate direction. Um, that's kind of the basics of entering a data point uh, or damage point. If you don't like what you've entered, you want to make a change for some reason, you can click Modify Point. So that's a little looks kind of like a lightning bolt, but I think it's actually a little pencil. And uh, highlight your point. That's going to bring the menu back up. You can make a change to any one of these features here. And uh, save it. If you don't like the point, you want to delete it for some reason, click Modify Point, highlight the point, and then this little X over the thumbtack is the Delete Point feature. Simply confirm that you want to delete the point, and the point goes away. So that is all the functionality of adding and removing and editing a damage point. The damage polygon is the next set of three features here. In order to add a damage polygon, you click on this Add Polygon button. That's the, the shape with the three red marks or the four red marks on it, and you can click and draw your polygon either, either counterclockwise or clockwise. And those users that remember the last version know that you had to go a certain direction. We fixed that in this version. You can draw the polygon in any direction you like. Um, once the, the polygon has been completed and you double click, double click it to complete, you can enter in comments. Uh, you can enter in injuries, deaths, EF scale for this polygon area. You can enter in a length in miles or a width in yards. Once you hit save, this is going to be uh, saved within, um, kind of show up as kind of this orange polygon line area. And you do have the ability, if you wish, to draw multiple polygons, uh, one right on top of one another. Um, so you can add one inside. If you have a, say a higher area, say EF4, EF5 type damage, you can layer them if you wish. Uh, if you don't like the way the polygon drew out, you can click this Modify Polygon button. And then you simply click on the polygon you wish to edit. It's going to bring the vertices up. If you want to move one of the vertices, you click on it. It'll turn red. And you can kind of drag it around in any direction you, you want when you found where you want to uh, modify or move the vertice to. You click again and double click to complete. So you've got the ability to modify and redraw the polygons. If you want to modify the, the polygons data, you can click the modify, modify polygon button there 
it will bring up the common, uh, comments box and you can make changes to the comments. If you want to delete the polygon, uh, you hit this uh, delete polygon button with the red X on it. Well, I'm sorry, you have to hit modify polygon first. No, you don't do that. What do you do now? You just hit the delete. Okay. So you do hit the delete polygon button, highlight the, the polygon, it'll turn it blue and then ask you if you want to delete the selected feature and you can confirm with a yes and it disappears. Um, okay, so I'm just moving along the different buttons here. This is an initial extent button. This will zoom you back to your initial extent, whatever you define that to be. We'll zoom back down into the Kansas City area. Um, this next button here is GPS on, GPS off. I've got a, a GPS, kind of a virtual GPS attached to this, so I'm going to turn it on. I think it's running. No, it's not running. There it is. Okay. Okay, so when the GPS turns on, simulating a trip here, what it's going to show you is this little, this arrow and uh, with a green dot over it, and it's going to kind of show a little contrail behind the uh, the GPS position symbol that gives you a sense of which direction you're going to move in, or you're moving in, if you are moving. And um, what it'll do, you will see it kind of try and move out of bounds here, and the screen should snap to that GPS center point. Um, we're currently using this free software called Fransom GPS Gate. That's what we recommend that all all users uh, use to uh, connect their GPS to it, and I think it does give you the ability to split the GPS signal out. So if you want to use Google Earth or, or another program to, uh, to kind of plot your position while you, while you do your damage survey, um, you can do that with this Fransom GPS gate program. The instructions for installing that are within the instruction packet. Well, that's how you turn your GPS on, GPS off. Um, Information, if you have a, a point, let me go ahead and put some points down while this GPS is moving. And I'll put one here and I'll give this one a direction. So you can see the red arrow that comes up. So we've got three or four points here and I'm going to put a polygon in here. around this damage area. Whoops, and it snapped me back already. It runs in a loop, so it's back at the beginning of the loop. Then back up to where I drew that polygon. I'm going to turn the GPS off here. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of other features here. <clears throat> when you're adding a point, if say your vehicle was driving down the center of the street here and you wanted to add a point over here on uh, Starbucks, which is offset from, from Ward Parkway here, um, but you wanted to preserve the position of your GPS, I'm going to have to turn the GPS back on. I'll use a different street. If you wanted to put a point over here, but you want to preserve the position of your GPS, so you want to know where you were when you recorded the point, what you do is you put the point down, and you turn on this little box over here that says Use GPS Lat and Lawn. What that will do is as soon as you click that check mark, that will capture your current Lat and Lawn latitude, and uh, that will preserve it within the table, table in addition to the location of the point you click. So just a nice little trick for some reason if you want to know where you were, and know that you were looking at something that was significantly offset, you can use this feature to capture that type of information. Okay. Um, I was going to demonstrate this information feature right here, this little box or this little icon here that allows you to query the, um, the details of features that were captured for a particular point or particular polygon, so it's just a way to query it without having to edit it. And so you can see everything that was recorded within the database. Um, this button here, the green button says EF Kit, that pulls the EF Kit up for you. So I'll click that, 
and you can use this to get quick set, quick access to the EF kit uh, to calibrate your results as you're surveying. And to get out of it, you just simply exit that program. The laptop application runs in the background. Um, this button here is a set of file operations, allows you to save the database, and allows you to uh, load a clean database. So perhaps if you're surveying, um, once you complete your surveying, you might want to save a copy of the database for the day just in case you needed to come back and look at it again on the laptop application. Um, so you can hit, hit this button, and um, I'm going to turn the GPS off at this point. And that saves it for you. And it saves it within this directory here called StormMaps Database Archive. So you can see the, uh, the archive directory here. And this is under the C storm data which one this one then oh this one here Yeah, make sure you have read-write permissions uh, when you do installations, because apparently I can't get to this right now. But that would tell you the uh, location where you can store the uh, the data, um, which is within. For some reason, my directory went missing. The um, feature below it, load clean database, that allows you to. Clear out the database. So, for example, if you have a, if you've already saved it and you've got a, uh, a database that needs to uh, be repopulated, refreshed, because you're going to do a fresh survey, you click this feature, and all this is is it tells you that you need to go to the uh, the database directory um, at this location and clear out these two files. And uh, once you restart the uh, the uh, storm damage survey application, it'll it will repopulate with fresh uh, mobile cache database and mobile cache da database journal files. Um, once you're done with your survey, if you want to send the data and um, send it back up to the server, you hit this. You've got to check the operational server box to send it to the operational server. Currently, the test server feature does not work at the moment. It hasn't been enabled on the server side. We will get, uh, get that set up here uh, in the near future. But you'll have to enter in your password. Hit login, and it'll give you a confirmation on both the points and the polygon. And uh, once that's been uploaded, you can go to the website, to the data interface. So I've already loaded here. And there they are. You can see that the points that we just uploaded are now in the system. It'll take a second for that to refresh, but we've got our three damage points in Midtown, Kansas City, and uh, the one polygon that was drawn. And if, if you wanted to, you could use the, uh, the interface here to delete or change anything in there. Um, so if I go back in here, back out a little bit. Well, I think I cleared it out when I did the refresh. You could go out and uh, delete the data, and it would uh, transmit the data. Well, if you retransmit, if you deleted and retransmitted, it would uh, remove the data that's been uh, uploaded onto the server. If you wanted to uh, make changes um, to any other parameters, like the storm date or the survey, the survey date, while you're collecting the information, you can do that up here in the right-hand corner here. Um, survey date usually is defaulted to the current Windows clock date and time. The storm date can be set to anything you want it to be. Um, you can change the, change the survey date if you need to. Office ID should be your three-letter NWS ID. 
Um, you've got the ability to assign an event ID on the right-hand right -hand side. We just defaulted it to Storm 1. You can call it whatever you want to. And, uh, of course, I mentioned the uh, ability to record the current GPS position here. If you need online help, um, there's a help feature right here. You can click that. Uh, gives you pretty much everything you need that I just demonstrated uh, in the um, the uh, demo here today. Probably the most important thing that you'll use most frequently at the bottom here is the keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, I think so. And then I, I think you can go as far as... So that is a summary of the operation of the laptop application. And um, <laughs> last two slides that I have are the shortcut keys. I'm not going to recite all of these, but I've, I've got them here in the presentation, which is out on the the damage assessment tool set, tool set Google site for, uh, for your use and reference. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over now to Parks Camp. And uh, Parks is going to give you uh, a demo of the mobile uh, app for Android, iPhone, and uh, BlackBerry. Parks, just give me a second here to turn the screen over to you. Excuse me. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, hopefully, everybody can see my screen now. I'll get this uh, just a couple slides to show, and then we'll go into the demo for the mobile devices. Uh, let's see. All right. So, um, one thing with the installation on mobile devices, uh, we have gotten that approved with the CIO's office. It's, uh, however, the uh, it is optional, uh, and when you have to have a waiver, that we uh, had to get from the CIO's office to do that. I know there's a little bit of angst about that waiver from uh, from some people. Uh, we're actually working with the uh, CIO's office now to see if we can get some of the wording relaxed, since we're uh, you know not dealing with any personally identif personal identif personally identifiable information (PII) that word, and nothing really sensitive uh, when we're sending this over the air. So we're going to get some of those relaxed. Uh, what we can tell you though is that this is really a, a CYA type of a, agreement. Um, Nobody's going to be coming out inspecting devices um, because of the nature of the project and, and what we're collecting. The, the chances of anybody coming to say, let me see your phone and see what data you've been collecting on this, this app is, is pretty much extremely, extremely unlikely. So uh, I can give you that. And like I said, we're, we're working with the CIO's office to kind of adjust the, the wording to make it a little bit less, um, uh, less restrictive. All right. Uh, for, the, for the device requirements for the... Um, for the mobile app, uh, it's basically Apple iPod 2 or newer, or iPad 2 or newer, uh, with iOS 4.1 or, or greater. Uh, you need to be careful if you're if you're using this. The Wi-Fi version of the iPad does not have an internal GPS chip. Um, it only does get your location through Wi-Fi, so that won't do you any good if you're out in the out in the sticks. And and uh, even if you're not, it probably won't give you a really good location. So uh, the the uh, the version that has the, the basically the cellular capability uh, has the GPS chip, so you need to keep, kind of keep that in mind. Uh, Apple iPhone 3GS are newer. Uh, in terms of the Androids, uh, the tablets are, or the phones, uh, some of the older models don't really have enough internal memory to run the uh, run the program and run some of its uh, capabilities. So um, generally, it needs to have about 512 megabytes of internal RAM or, or greater. Most of the phones within the last year or so uh, do have that, but um, if, it, if it doesn't, then you could run into some issues when taking pictures with the app. Um, there are the OS versions that are listed. Uh, there may be even some a little bit later if something new, new has come out. Uh, it needs to certainly have a camera and a GPS, which I think most, uh, most certainly most of them in the last year or so are all going to have uh, that. In terms of BlackBerry, I know there's still uh, a few users that are using Blackberries out there. Um, Right now we have an app, and it's, it's slightly different from the one for Android and, and Apple. Um, we do have it out there for, for BlackBerry OS's 5.0 and Plus, but that does not include right now the new Blackberries that are getting ready to come out, the BlackBerry 10 Blackberries. We're not, uh, we don't have that supported at this time. We'll have to revisit that uh, possibly at a later time. All right, um, one quick word of caution to anybody out there who currently has um, has the DAT mobile software on their devices already. Um, 
even if you just downloaded it in the last week or, or uh, you know, before before yesterday, if you downloaded it before yesterday, you need to delete and reinstall it, reinstall it again. And, and the important part there is to delete it. That deletes some of the internal settings that aren't compatible with the with the latest version. So uh, just make sure you do that if you already have it on your phone from an earlier earlier download. And then the installation here, like I said, delete the previously installed. There's the web address to go to um, to download it. When you log into that web page, you'll be using your, your NOAA.gov uh, email credentials, uh, your Gmail credentials. Um, then you tap the tap the uh, installation, and um, and then it should uh, should commence. I've had a few issues with a couple people downloading the software that it's not uh, installing on a couple iPhones. Um, I think the, the answer may be to that is you can go to the Google site and download the file to your PC and then maybe sync it through, uh, through iTunes, but uh, we'll follow up on that in the next couple of days. But for the most part, we haven't had any, have not had any trouble with people installing the app. All right, some of the key features for the mobile application. Um, it's really, it's the, it doesn't have the full functionality necessarily that the laptop ap application does. It's primarily for uh, transmitting data and getting data up to the server. So once it's sent, you can't uh, can't do any editing from the uh, from the mobile app. But what you can do is you can add, uh, upload both the point data plus the pictures that you're taking out there as well. Uh, so you can take a picture along with the point data and send both of those up at the same time, and that'll get stored on the database. Uh, like the laptop application, it does store data locally uh, on the device if you're outside of data coverage. So if you're out in the sticks doing a survey, uh, you can. Uh, store it locally, and then when you get back into coverage, you can send all the data at that time. Uh, something new that I've uh, gotten in this newest version is an in-app update notification. So if we do have um, an update for the app that people need to download, when you open up the application and log in, um, it will notify you that you can go to the server and uh, download the newest version. Uh, so those first three points, that applies to both the, the phone and the tablet versions of the application. Um, the, or excuse me, the phone, yeah, phone and tablet versions. Uh, the last couple things here just apply to the tablet version. So this is your Android tablets or your uh, your iPads. Uh, there is some basic mapping of the points, and it'll show data from both the, from the database if you've got a if you've got a connection, um, and also the ongoing survey that you're doing. It'll show points uh, that you're collecting there. There is some basic offline mapping available, and it's done at the WFO level. Uh, it's not meant to be a real high-resolution map. It's just kind of meant to um, give you a general idea if you're out uh, away from coverage and kind of need to see kind of where you are and where your points are in relation to each other. And also with the tablet, there is uh, an EF kit reference. The reference images from the EF kit are built into the interface. So uh, many of you have probably gone on the PC. There's the EF kit uh, PC software, and all the images that are in that are built into the, the tablet interface. All right, so a couple of screens here that I won't I won't be showing when I do the demo here in a minute. Uh, the first one um, over to the to the left is the is the screen where you download the software. So that's what that'll look like after you after you log in. It'll tell you who, who you are who you're logged in as, and then you just tap the um, tap the installation that you want to do. Uh, the middle screen there that's what's going to appear the first time you log into the software, uh, and this is just a um, to basically enter a, enter a password for the application, and it's not connected to anything, so it's whatever you want it to be as long as it's eight characters long. So you just choose that, put it in there, and then when you open up the app, uh, you'll use that to uh, use that to log into it. And then on the right there too, um, since with my demo I won't be able to show a picture, uh, the simulator doesn't have a, a camera feature. So uh, when you take a picture in the app, that's the way it'll appear in the. Um, uh, in the window, and it'll, it'll make more sense here in a minute when you when you see the app. So, get on with the demo for that. Okay, so basically, I'm showing the kind of the tablet version, but um, everything until I turn it sideways is going to look the same, whether you're on a tablet or a, or a phone. So, uh, it'll look the same, and it's going to look the same whether or not you have an Android or an iPhone as well. All right, so we're going to start out by um, logging in. All right, the first time you log in, when you log in, it's going to typically go to this screen here, and then this is kind of in the future. If we have more different, uh, more forms that we want to use, say for flooding or something like that, we can add those in 
uh, to the interface. That's kind of for future stuff. The first time you log in, you're going to go straight to this options screen here. And this is where you initially you're going to choose the office ID uh, that you, for, for where you are and what office you're surveying. So you'll pick that. Uh, the second button here, this uh, determines what database you're going to be pointing to. Uh, <coughs> the operation with database, which is if you're out on actual surveys, that's where you want to be pointed to. Uh, if you're just testing the application or doing a demo for somebody or uh, just doing a test survey or something like that, uh, tap on that and that'll switch it over to test and that'll send all the data to the test database and you can kind of have free reign over that um, um, to do you know any kind of experimental stuff you want or uh, you know uh, test surveys or um, working with um, maybe doing exercises with EMs or something like that. So you can uh, point to the test database for that. Uh, we want to try to keep the operational database as clean as possible in terms of uh, uh, keeping test data off of that. Uh, now, since this is a tablet, once I chose my office there, it popped up another button, which was, is to download the offline maps. And that will download, so if I click it there, it's going to download the maps for, for Tallahassee. Uh, it takes a little while to download. The, the file download's pretty large. Plus, it takes a while to actually install. So when you do click on that, you want to be patient. It can take several minutes to download, and then it will say in, uh, installing uh, map files. Please be patient there. It can take uh, as much as maybe five minutes to get those installed, and it will seem like it's frozen, but it's not. Just be patient with it, and then it will say download complete when it's all finished, and then you're good to go. Uh, you don't need to mess with the change server settings unless somebody specifically directs you to, uh, to do that. Um, kind of as a fail-safe, if something's really kind of gone catastrophically wrong with the servers or, or things aren't going well at all in terms of transmitting data, um, you can take the stored data on the phone and you can email it uh, back to your office uh, where you can at least get there there, and that, could, that uh, data can then at least be manually put into the uh, database through the, through the web interface, so it's kind of a fail-safe there. Uh, once you've done your selections here, we're going to go back to the, to the test database for this demo. Uh, you click the Save button, and that'll take you back to uh, this screen here. You're going to tap on the SCR slash TOR form, and then that'll pull up uh, this form here, and that's um, where all the work pretty much is going to, be, uh, going to be done for your form. Now down at the bottom, there's a status bar. Notice it's orange in this picture. That signifies that you're going to the test database. You're not going to the operational database. Uh, if it was black, that would indicate you're going to the, uh, to the, te to the operational database. So uh, if it's bright orange, you know you're, you're just sending test data, basically. Uh, a couple things at the top here. You can go back to the previous screen if you need to there by hitting the back button. Excuse me. Um, Here's the GPS button here, so you just tap the GPS button, and you'll see your GPS position pop up here on the, in the screen, and that'll auto-update if you're out in the field and your, and your GPS position is, um, is changing. Um, and let, what, you know, the only way you can take a picture or transmit a point is to have the GPS on, because you've got to have a position to be associated with everything. So if you notice, when the GPS is off, the Take Picture, but take picture button um, is grayed out. And then also the menu button here, this is where you transmit the points. The GPS is off. I can't send uh, any current point um, or anything like that. So I can only, with the GPS, I can only send anything that I've already have stored uh, previously or I can clear out the points that I've uh, stored if I, don't, if I don't need them. So we'll go back. We'll turn the GPS on. All right, so we've got our location there. And um, as we go through the menus here, the first thing we've got is the storm date. So we want to pick out the storm date. It defaults to the previous day because uh, for the most part, I think we uh, generally get the um, uh, surveys are done the next day, but that can be easily changed just with the, with the roller bar. So you can choose whatever date that you need to choose there. And then we get below that, we get into the EF scale uh, uh, system. So we've got the damage indicators, the DIs, and the DODs for each of those. So. Uh, we can, we, we've got our damage. Once we've got the GPS on, if you want first, you click the Take Picture button. It's going to pop up your camera. You take your picture, uh, and then you're going to select Use or Save for that picture, and it'll bring you back here and pop up that picture at the top. Uh, it's like that screenshot I showed you a, a few minutes ago. So we've got, um, got your picture taken. Uh, one thing to note here, too, is um, you're going to want to have your device Rotated with the bottom to the right when you take the pictures. That'll make sure the uh, 
pictures get oriented, oriented, oriented in the uh, correct direction, so uh, bottom of the device to the right uh, when you take your pictures. Uh, now we can rate our damage that we've just uh, taken a picture of or are looking at, even if we don't need to take a picture of it. Uh, we can choose from our damage indicator, and this matches uh, exactly what's in the, in the EF, uh, EF scale. So we can choose whatever we choose there. We choose a motel. And then these degrees of damage, that will adjust for you as well, and you can pick out uh, your degree of damage uh, for that type of, uh, for that event. It will then give you your expected wind speed according to the EF scale, and the bounds on this will be your lower end expected and your upper end expected, so you can adjust those as you need to. And as you notice, as I adjust those, if I move it into a different EF uh, category, it will change the EF uh, scale button below it. So you can do that. Uh, if you do need to, for some reason, change the EF scale different from what you've got indicated in the wind, you can do that. Um, if you've got a, a direction that the damage is going, you can do that as well. Same thing for injuries and uh, injuries and death as well. And then you can also click down here on the comments section and you can uh, type in any comments that, that you want to have. Uh, now, I've noticed on the, the new iPads, at least, and this may be, may be uh, an option on some of the Android devices as well, I don't know. Uh, you may see down here a little microphone, and you can actually dictate your comments in. Once, you, once the keyboard comes up, you can actually dictate your, your comments straight in. You don't have to type. So uh, that might be a handy feature, especially out in the field when you don't really um, may not have the hands to do a whole, lot of, uh, a whole lot of typing with that. So once you're done with that, now basically you're ready to transmit. So you go back to the, uh, the menu button, and you can either send the point now if you've got, got good coverage. You've got a couple of bars out there. You're on Wi-Fi or something. Uh, and you send that point. And then down here in the status, it's going to tell, tell you the status here. So it's already says it's going to say sending point and then point sent uh, when it's finished. So if you're just sending a point with no picture, it's going to happen uh, typically pretty fast, um, even on a relatively slow connection, just because it's just sending some text data uh, basically across the, uh, across the web. If you've got a picture attached, uh, what it's going to do is it's actually going to resize your picture on the device to get it down below about one megabyte. Uh, just to save on bandwidth and save on upload time um, and storage space on the on the server side. So it's going to re uh, resize, and you'll see the progress on the resize. Uh, when it's doing that, it will give you a percentage of how far along it is. And then once it's done resizing, it will send both the image and the, uh, the point up to the database. Okay, so, um, so basically everything I've done so far is going to be basically the same whether you're on a phone or a tablet. Now if I tip the tablet over, on the side here, uh, what you're going to see is a map pop up, and I'll make this a little bigger now. All right. Okay, so now this is, this basically is the added feature with the tablet is uh, a large portion of the screen then becomes a uh, becomes a map. Uh, now you should see it should see a point um, that shows up there where you just, where we just collected it. If that doesn't happen the first time, just uh, click the back button and then go back into the form, and it should pop up at that point, and you see it there. Um, so that's a little uh, minor bug. I hadn't worked out yet, but you see the point. That's where we just collected. Uh, you can't really see the information on the point you just collected, but it gives you an idea of where it was, uh, that kind of thing. So you can zoom in on the map, certainly, uh, however your device allows you to zoom in, whether it's uh, you know double tapping or, or you can use the slider bar that's up there as well. Uh, so you can zoom in. Now the maps that are looking at now, these are online maps. So if you've got connectivity, you'll, it'll default to an online map. Um, and you can do the street map, which this is. Uh, you can pull up an aerial uh, aerial map as well uh, to do, use that to uh, see if see any features that you'd like to see. And also a topo map, which is kind of a nice, uh, uh, not too bad of a background. Um, if you've lost connectivity, if you're out in somewhere that doesn't have connectivity, you can click the offline button here. And these are the um, the offline maps, and like I said, they're not uh, they're not meant to be great detail. They're meant to kind of give you a rough idea. There's only a couple of uh, zoom uh, versions available. So as you zoom in, you'll see them uh, update there. So this is about the highest um, level of detail you're going to get, but it give you a general idea of where you are and where your other points are in relation to that. Okay, so let me uh, change my position here. Let me zoom back out a little bit and, and update my GPS position. 
and collect another uh, collect another point here. We'll move a little to the to the west. All right, I'm going to turn my GPS back back on. And okay, there you go. So my GPS is updated now, a little off to the uh, to the west. I want to collect another point. So I've taken my picture, and it's we'll imagine that it's showing up up there. And I've got another um, point I've taken. This is a mobile home, so I've got the single wide mobile home. I'm going to pick my threshold of damage. And I want a little reference period to look at. So if I click on the question mark here, uh, you're going to see the pictures that are basically in the EF kit are going to pop up. And you can tap on the pictures, and it'll scroll through whatever pictures are available for that uh, uh, for that uh, degree of damage. So you can do that. I click the question mark to knock it off, and uh, you can go to a different one if you need to. Um, look at some reference pictures for that. So that's unit rolling on its side. A couple pictures for that. Uh, so that's just hopefully useful to help you gauge what kind of damage you've got uh, going out in the field. So uh, you can do that as well. All right, so we've got everything we want to there. Now let's say we're out uh, pretty much um, out in the sticks where we don't really have any coverage. And if you do get out of coverage, you, this thing, the software should automatically detect that and change to an offline status down here at the bottom. Uh, and um, But even if it's not, even if still says online, but you've got kind of limited coverage and your little it's a little shaky. Go up here to the menu button and you can do send point later and it'll store that point locally then in the picture you've already already taken. And down here where it says cache, it'll say one. So I've got one point stored. And it also showed up in the map, you see that there. So these these big uh, triangles with the black X's, those are your locally stored points on the these that's what you've been collecting from the device. All right, so let's uh, move again. a little bit farther west. All right, so we've moved again, and we've got a different piece of damage here. And yeah, we've got pretty bad damage here, at, uh, borderline EF4, EF5, so um, we'll do that. Let's see, there's some pictures for that. So that's your, your house swept clean, pretty much. Okay, so we'll store that one as well, send that point later. All right, so now we've got uh, two points cached, and then this other one that we already already sent a little earlier. And now let's say we're <coughs> now we've gotten back into the coverage area and we're ready to send our points uh, that we've got stored. So basically, you go here and you go to hit Send Stored Points, and that'll send everything that's in your uh, in your cache. So that's sending those points, and then when it's done, it's going to say Point Sent. So those points have all been sent. Uh, so now we can go back to the uh, the web editor that we just saw here, and we'll zoom in. And here are our points that we uh, just collected here. Yep, there they are. Let it catch up a second here. There they are. All right, so there's our uh, couple points that we grabbed there, our two EF. Uh, EF1 points and then our EF4 point over there. So they're automatically they're sent up to the server and we should be uh, should be good to go there. All right, so that's kind of um, the way you collect the points there. Um, you know, you may see occasionally if, if you try to send a point and say it doesn't get sent completely, say the server's really busy maybe or, or your connection's kind of shaky and it's kind of cutting in and out, you may see something that says uh, send failed or uh, something like that. Um, and that, you know, in that situation, just kind of be patient, wait a few minutes, um, and, and give it another try. Um, you know, sometimes um, if the server's really backed up or something, it may, may take a few tries to get it sent in. But just be patient with that, and uh, the data will get there. As long as it's still sitting in your cache right there, uh, the data's safe. So, and once it's, uh, once it's sent, it should be confirmed to be on the server, so you should be in good shape there. Uh, so let's say you've... you've um, completed this survey and then it's a couple days later and you want to start a new survey, uh, these points, these you know local points that you've got collected here are still sitting there. All you have to do is hit uh, new survey and it'll wipe those out and, uh, um, and you can uh, start over again. So that's the, uh, the general operation there of the, um, of the laptop, or excuse me, the, uh, the mobile applications. And I think I just about uh, covered there. 
if you've collected a bunch of points, say, for testing or something like that, and you just want to clear them out, you can hit the clear stored points there, and that will clear out the, the cache as well um, if you need to do that. All right, so that's uh, pretty much the, the quick and dirty. Like I said, it's, it's designed to be a fairly simple interface. It's not doesn't have a whole lot of – doesn't have any editing capability or anything like that. So it's primarily just to get the, uh, get the data up to the server. Um, and so I think with that, I think that um, – gets us about to the end of uh, what we had planned. So if you've got any questions, uh, let's see. There may be a few in the in the chat now. And let's see. So uh, one of the questions we've got here now is um, can you measure the distance? Let's see. Let me get down to it here. Can you measure the distance between two points? Um, and you, uh, can you tag photos to the points? In the laptop application, you cannot tag photos to the points right now. Uh, once you've uploaded the points to the server, and we'll cover this uh, tomorrow, you can go in uh, through the web editor and attach photos to points. So if you've uploaded some points with the laptop and then you've got some pictures that you want to associate with those points, you can do that through the web editor. Um, and then uh, measuring the distance, Chris, is that uh, can you do that in the laptop application? Uh, that is currently not a feature of the laptop application. Okay. Can't do it in the laptop. You can do it. Once again, you can do it on the, um, you can do it on the web interface. Uh, you can do that. All right, so um, now in terms of um, with the tablet, this can be done over 3G or 4G or wireless or whatever you have uh, available to you when you're out in the field. Um, if you're uploading pictures and you've got like old edge network or something like that, I'd probably caution against sending those points until you get a better connection because that could take a while. Um, with the uh, laptop, I'd also like to mention that uh, you know if you've got an air card, it'll work with an air card, Wi-Fi, or you could even bring it back to the office to upload the data. So uh, it doesn't matter uh, what your connection is. Okay, so let's see. We got a question: Can the polygon color be changed on the laptop app so it's not the same color as the roads? Uh, that's probably something we can look into changing probably with an update. Um, the, photo up, the photos up late at full resolution, or are they downsized? No, they are downsized, uh, just especially with the way phone cameras are advancing these days with um, uh, high megapixel counts. Trying to send those uh, quickly over an Internet connection, which oftentimes is maybe not the speediest out where you're doing surveys, not really feasible. Uh, that's why we resize them on the, um, uh, on the phone. Now, if you've got um, – if, you, if you've got – if you really want the full resolution on there, you can go through the web editor and you uh, should be able to upload those. You could attach them to points that way. Uh, we can kind of go over that uh, tomorrow. Let's see. Um, no, th uh, this question is, am I correct to assume this also works on Mac laptops? No, it doesn't work. The laptop application does not, uh, does, is not compiled for a Mac laptop. Let's see. Mark says a question at the very top about uh, wind damage, thunderstorm wind damage over an area. And yeah, and I think, uh, I think you covered that when you drew uh, a thunderstorm polygon. Okay. I think, I think that one's covered. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? There, there, is a, um, there is a feature that allows you to separate thunderstorm damage from EF damage, EF rated damage. Uh, right. And you can do that in the, in the um, iPhone and Android apps as well. If it's not, if it's not tornado damage, you can choose um, – you can choose thunderstorm wind damage as well, and it'll go up to the server and it'll look. It'll be a circle instead of a, a triangle. Uh, let's see. Android Wi-Fi only tap, tablet with wireless access point should work. If it has GPS, that should work just fine. Yeah, you just have to be be where you, you know wherever you have wherever you have internet access, you should be fine as long as you have the the uh, internal GPS. Uh, is there any way we can have a GPS history track? Um, that's something we could look into. We'll take that as kind of a feature uh, feature request and look into that for for some future versions. See if we can build that. Uh, see if we can build that in. Oh, that's a that's a good idea. Let's see. Uh, is anyone having trouble downloading that to government iPhones? Um, I've had a couple of people um, mention they've had an issue downloading to their iPhone. Um, I'm not sure if they've been government iPhones or not. It's not out of the question. Um, uh, we'll, we can check on that, and if anybody's on, when we open up the phones, if there are folks up there that have successfully done it to government phones, if you could uh, chime in then. 
Let's see. For the iPad app, how many CWAs worth of offline maps can be loaded before leaving cell coverage? Um, right now, it's it's only only one. So only the only the um, CWA that you have you, that you're that you've selected in the app, uh, you, you'll download that one. If you need to download another one, you have to select another office and then download uh, download the maps again. So right now, it's only one uh, one set of online maps is available, and that's just mainly because of size. Uh, considerations. Okay. Um, can we move data from the test server to the operational server? That is, if we had EMs doing the surveys, they could post to the test server, then we could push them over. Uh, caution here: the, none of these interfaces are to be used by EMs. They're only to be used by weather service employees doing official surveys. Now, if the EM gives you data and you want to enter it into the, as a web service employee, enter it into the interface through the web interface, through the web interface as, a, as an official survey, that's, that's fine. Uh, but the application is not designed to be used by EMs, either the laptop um, or the web, the web editor uh, or the mobile applications. Um, so it's just for weather service personnel only. Now, certainly with the public viewer, they can go in and view the, view the damage. Uh, but they don't need to be putting uh, information directly into the database test or operational. All right, can shapefile KMLs be imported into the laptop version? Uh, not yet. It's something I think we're looking into. Um, along those same lines, we're also looking into, uh, we're working with NASA uh, to ingest um, high-resolution post-event satellite imagery, um, and we're trying to get that, at the very least, um, and this is this is like your high resolution stuff uh, that uh, that's taken right after an event. Uh, we're trying to get that uh, working with them to get that available uh, first in the the web editor, so that could be overlaid on your on your map in the web editor, and then possibly into the at least the mobile application, the tablet application map, to where you'd be able to um, uh, load that on the device as well. All right, well, did that work on Windows 8 tablets? Um, let's see. I know Keith Stelman has it on a Windows tablet, but I'm not sure if it's a Windows 8 tablet. Um, if he's on the line when we unmute the phones here in a minute, we'll have him uh, chime in on that one um, and see. I, so I don't know the answer to that one right off. Uh, is the software download Sky to Secure uh, website? Uh, yes, your, your username and password is is going is actually going through the Google uh, the Google interface, so it's not going over in clear text at all. Uh, it's being handled completely by the Google uh, Google Google side of things, so that's uh, it shouldn't be an issue. So your your LDAP uh, email username password is not going in clear text. Uh, can a path width be entered? Uh, yes, we we have a capability um, right now. It's not uh, it's not in the uh, the mobile applications, but in the web interface, we have uh, you, know, you can draw a path, which is basically a line segment for your for your track, and you can enter the width uh, uh, width of the path in that. Uh, you can also uh, it also calculates the length of the path for you, um, and some other some of the other information that you need for your PNSs and also for storm data. So we'll cover some of that uh, tomorrow. Uh, let's see. Start the process of downloading mobile app for a device, um, and it said I allow access to manage your sites. What does that mean? Um, it, it means that because we're hosting the uh, the information on on a Google site, I think uh, that's what it's um, that's what it's talking about. Since we have it, with, since we're trying to allow you to get access to the Google site to download the the um, the application, it has nothing to do with us messing with your. Uh, any other Google sites that you may that you may have. All right. So uh, let's see. Did you say you can send several points, and when a connection is established, those cache points will automatically go to the server? Uh, it won't be automatic. You can collect several points if you're out and don't have a connection, and then when you get back into coverage, you go to the the menu and you select send stored points, and that will send them, and it'll send them all everything that you have in your cache. So uh, it won't automatically detect when you get back in coverage and send them automatically, but you can, once you get back into coverage, you can hit the button and send them all automatically. Uh, can this be used for non-thunderstorm or tornado um, damage? Um, if, you want to, if you want to use it for something other than thunderstorm and tornado right now, 
Uh, we ask that you use the, um, the test database as the target and not the operational. We're trying to keep the operational um, confined right now to just uh, thunderstorm and tornado damage. Let's see, are there any future plans to utilize archived radar data? Uh, that could uh, possibly go along with um, some of the work we're doing with NASA in terms of satellite data, so there may be some ways we can um, do a little bit of that as well. Um, it's not gonna be probably something like, uh, it's not gonna have any capabilities like GRNOS or anything like that. That'd be kind of a whole separate, separate thing. Okay, well, with the mobile device, what does the accuracy number mean when you turn on GPS? Uh, that's, that comes from the GPS on whatever device you are, and that's an estimate of how accurate your position is estimated to be. So if it, it's set on there five meters, so, you know, it's, you know in, that, in that case, it'd be roughly accurate to within about uh, 15 feet or so. Um, and usually when you first turn on your GPS, on most devices, that number may be pretty big. It may be 1,000 meters or something. Um, and then as, as you get triangulated with the satellites, that number will come down. All right, if you accidentally enter a survey in test mode, can you port it over to the operational uh, black? Uh, right now, there's not an easy way to do that. If that does happen to you, uh, let me know. Uh, uh, you can email the list or email me uh, directly, and I'll help you uh, uh, work that out if that does happen. That may be something we need to think about in the future is um, as a way to kind of send stuff to the different different database if necessary. Uh, for the laptop app, do we need to uninstall the old before the new? Uh, Chris? Yes, you do. Um, you just okay. go into the uh, control panel, add remove programs, and uh, there'll be an option in there for the laptop application. Also, just delete the storm data And also, you'll need to delete the storm data directory. Okay, uh, this is uh, from uh, Pablo in Miami. He was successfully to install on his uh, government, government iPad, but not on his personal phone. So uh, there may be a couple issues with, with some phones. We'll look into that and, um, and see, uh, see if we can figure out what the issue is with uh, certain, uh, certain iPhones. So haven't uh, quite isolated that issue yet. Uh, can people at WFO access data from the server after it's uploaded? Absolutely, once it's uploaded, uh, anybody at the WFO can go to the web editor site, uh, log in there, and then they can see the data. They can go ahead and quality control the data if you want them to. Uh, and then if, if you're on your way back from the survey and they're all quality controlled, they can create the KMLs and, and do whatever they need to do there. And we'll go over some of that uh, again tomorrow. Uh, there, are there any plans to put a phone into, or map into the phone version? Um, not right now, just because the screen space is so limited, um, but um, something we can kind of consider if we can figure out kind of a, a way that will uh, work in a pleasing uh, way where we can use the screen real estate well. Let's see. Yeah, we'll try to open up the audio questions here, here shortly. I'm trying to get through all the questions we had typed in. Uh, is there ability to type in a lat lawn? Uh, Chris, I believe there is an option for that. Is there an option for that in the um, laptop application? Uh, no, there is not. They have to uh, click on the map to get a lat lawn. Okay, yeah, you'd have to click on the, so you'd have to, in the laptop application, you'd have to click on the map. Um, and basically it's the same for the web editor as well. You need to click on the map in the location. Now on the, on the web editor, uh, you do have a lat lawn readout, so you would know where you're, where you're clicking, so you can get it, uh, get it that way. Uh, on the laptop app, when you create a polygon, is the max width of the polygon automatically generated? No, it's not. Uh, it's not automatically generated right now. Uh, can NSSL Doppler rotational tracks be entered as a graphic to help initiate starting points for damage surveys? Not yet. Uh, that's one of those kind of future things that we're working on. Uh, do you have to have your NOAA email going to the device on which you use for the mobile app? No, you do not. Um, Basically, all you're doing when you when you log in there um, with the Google login is just verifying your identity as a NOAA employee, and so we and and allowing you to download the device. You don't have to remain logged in to that. You can log straight back out once you, once you've downloaded uh, the application. So you don't you don't need to have your email going to your device. 
All right, will there be a measuring tool for path width and length uh, a polygon? There is in the um, in the web the web editor right now. Okay, let's see. All right, if you're doing a survey and initially designate 25 points as thunderstorm damage, then determine near the end of the survey that the storm was tornadic, you need to manually change all the points from thunderstorm to tour. Uh, yeah, right now you would have to do that kind of point by point. Uh, that's not one of the batch things that we've got um, uh, worked out yet. So uh, right now you'd have to do that individually. Okay. Uh, can you do multiple photos for each point? No, not right now. We don't have that capability to do multiple photos for each point. So just one photo per point. Uh, uh, the, in terms of the camera orientation, because why is the camera orientation opposite of what iOS does with the shutter button is the up and, and down volume. Um, when the picture is generated, it's right side up when the home button's to the right. So that's the way the picture gets, gets, uh, gets put out. Um, so and I don't... Uh, we don't right now. I don't have a way to uh, haven't haven't gotten a way to uh, automatically rotate that. So that's all the. Oh, here's one more here. Uh, how would you plot two tornado tracks um, that are close to each other? Um, in terms of if they're on the same day, I mean, when you you plot the points in there and you can draw lines that that intersect and cross each other, um, that shouldn't be shouldn't be a problem. You right, can we'll give them different the storm ideas. So I think that's, uh, let's see, is that all we had typed in? So, Chris, if you want to open up the phones, if we've got we've got time for a, a couple of questions. Mark, uh, you can also just mention that uh, they can enter multiple storm IDs to uh, events that might be geographically close on the same day. Right. Through the yeah, that's with the laptop application. Yep. Okay. I'm going to try and open the lines now. The leader has turned lecture off, okay, you and your there, line Mark? has been unmuted. I'm still here. I think um, the lines are open. Is, uh, is there anybody else that would like to ask a question at this point? Yeah, this uh, is Andy in Pleasant Hill. I've got a few. Okay, go okay. ahead. Uh, I appreciate you addressing security because that's really a deal killer for personal devices. Who, uh, if I if I load it on my phone, who knows I did it? Who's tracking that I did it? And, and yeah, how do they know? Okay, right now the only place that uh, we have a, one file on the server uh, that just lists the email of, um, of who has downloaded the device. It doesn't go anywhere. That, you know, that's it. Um, that's the only spot, that's the only place it's going to know. But if you're a, a Central Region employee, Andy, um, your MIC and ITO should know, and then you also should have submitted your name to uh, the database of users we're keeping here at the Central Region. Got through the paperwork. And uh, that would be documented in the paperwork also. Yeah, I didn't do that because I won't submit to the security things. Um, uh, my next question is, why not allow emergency managers to do that? Uh, there's a lot of cases where we've got an area in our CWA four hours away. They could quickly plot up some points and test, send it to us, and we can evaluate whether or not we're going to make the trip up there. Uh, I think there's a lot of utility, and I don't think you should just uh, – say EMs aren't capable, because they certainly are capable. A lot of them have been doing this for a couple of decades. Um, thank you, Andy. That is, uh, it's not necessarily that they're not capable of doing it. Um, there are, one, there are issues with uh, distributing the application of out, outside the National Weather Service. Um, and there are, we've been advised by CIO's office and um, also general counsel that that's not to be allowed at this time. I guess I'd ask you to let them know that that's a case of security getting involved or getting in the way of service. This is Paul at Southern Region Headquarters. Believe me, I have taken that up, and I have been told by DOC IG we cannot at this time. I understand I'd ask them security getting in the way of operations, but things. this is a legal issue with the software right now. Hey, uh, Paul, this is Walt, Southern Region Headquarters. Maybe as an alternative uh, for the Emergency Management Committee, they can still go in for their pictures and data points uh, from their cell phones directly to a weather service email address at your local WFO. They yeah, can still do that, that's absolutely. That's possible. They could do that, um, give you any information you need, and then that data could be entered into the database through the web interface. Uh, 
Uh, Keith, uh, Keith Stelman, are you on the line? I think he was out doing some surveys, Park. Okay, uh, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, I was going to ask him about his, uh, his tablet, but uh, um, yeah, I wasn't sure if he, he, has, a, he, has, a, he has a tablet running uh, the laptop application, a Windows tablet. I wasn't sure if it was I Windows 8. it's a Windows 8 tablet, but I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions uh, that want to be asked? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Kurt over Huntsville. I was just curious, um, let's say if you were on a survey and you took a lot of points and you labeled it you know, Storm A, is there a way to, and then you, you found later that it might have been two tracks that were really close that were part, or that tornado part were another? Could you import, you know, those points where the, that were the second tornado out into a new, you know, a, a storm plot? Um, well, in terms of the, say, extracting out a KML or something like that, um, they, they won't be necessarily grouped by, by the storm ID. It's just going to be a matter of what you, uh, the points that you select in your, when you draw out the polygon and also maybe the date filter you have on there. So uh, right now, no, there, if you've got them crossing and they're uh, you know, on the same day, it's going to be difficult actually right now to, uh, to separate those out using the web editor to get a KML. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Uh-huh. Hey, Parks. This is Walter here up in the region. I, I have a question for you. Uh, okay. The, uh, for the uh, mobile application, whether it be on the uh, phone or for a tablet, is there the capability to take the uh, NSSL uh, velocity uh, tracks that uh, we often get that uh, can help forecasters maybe get a better fix early in the storm survey process to uh, hone in a little bit closer, especially if they're out in a, in a, in a, in a uh, sparse area. Is there a way to get that as a back, background map? Yeah, uh, not yet. It's something that's kind of probably going to go a little bit hand-in-hand -hand with the work we're doing with NASA and the satellite imagery there. Um, and so it, we're going to, and working with SPC and NSSL to kind of get that uh, taken care of. So that is something we're, we're looking at down the road, but that we don't have that yet. Great. Thanks. Hey, this Anybody is else? Bar yeah, this is Lyle Barker, Central Illinois. Um, question for you on the mobile app. Um, is there any plans to add the ability to put polygons into that, or is it just going to be points? Uh, right now it's just points. Uh, certainly down the road uh, that could be an option, but right now it's just points. Okay, thanks. This is Stephen Springfield. Going back to the manual entry of points and, and Andy Bailey's question, uh, is there something stopping the ability to pull in from a Excel database into this program? Well, the something stopping would be we, we haven't we haven't coded it for that. Um, it could be you know uh, potentially something down the road, but it's not something we have uh, in our immediate uh, immediate plans. Uh, along those lines, if, if any of you, any of those feature requests that, that any of you have made that we don't have the capability that you're looking for yet, uh, go ahead and email uh, myself and Chris Lander, and and so we can take those down and make sure we um, we have notes of those so we can we can look at those as we move forward. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, uh, once again, we'll be back same time on uh, tomorrow, and we'll be discussing in detail the, uh, the, web, the web interface and uh, how you go about quality controlling data and entering data and extracting data and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so we'll be talking about that on Wednesday at the same time. Um, and if you have any other questions or anything, just email us and uh, let us know. And Parks, again, uh, for those that uh, are coming in late on this call, you say this uh, will be recorded and on the LMS. No. Uh, when can they expect that? Uh, I think today's Chris's uh, goal is to have it up by the end of the day on our on the project Google site. He'll have it up there, recorded, and then um, it may take a little longer to get it to the LMS, but it will end up on the LMS. Excellent. Good job, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone, and we'll uh, see you tomorrow. Thanks, Chris and Parks. Great job. All right. Thanks, Paul.